Achieving optimal health and self-realization in the modern world involves more than just diets of our food and exercise. It requires a new relationship with light, externally and internally. Welcome to The Light Diet. We're live. How's it going, Jack? Pretty good. Great. Well, as you know, I wanted to talk about everything today. And this podcast, which I didn't really tell you much about, I'm calling it The Light Diet. So talking about the the diet of light as opposed to the diet of food. And although most people who would listen to this should know who you are, if for some reason they don't know who you are, I want to kind of start a little bit from the beginning. I haven't heard you talk about your origin story for a really long time. You know, like the whole deal with Michelangelo and, you know, tearing your knee meniscus and learning about leptin. So could you kind of give someone who maybe doesn't know that story a bit of a background about what kind of got you fired off in the first place to go down um, this road? Probably about 16 years ago now. um, I was 360 pounds, six foot two. I was given a talk at uh, in Birmingham on minimally invasive spine to orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons. When I stood up to go to the podium to give my talk, I had a horrible pain in my right knee. Long story short, there was a lot of orthopedic surgeons there. Uh, they examined me, thought that I had a meniscus tear. Uh, one of the orthopedic surgeons' wives who was there happened to work for a biotech company. Um, Later that night, she kind of told me, look, my husband says you're a smart guy. I think I know why this happened to you. She sent me six papers, a book. The six papers were all tied to something called leptin, which I had really never heard of. Leptin was discovered in 1994 at Rockefeller University in New York. Um, And this lady had, she worked for a biotechnology company in California. Um, And basically what she was trying to tell me is that the leptin trials by Big Pharma were being cooked that's kind of where she wanted me to go with the whole thing. And uh, instead, um, the papers actually didn't sway me. It was actually the book that she sent me that swayed me. Um, and that book was called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And it was written by Robin Sharma. It's an old um, book, but it, it there was a couple of key lines in it that really caught me. And there was a couple of key things in it that freaked me out. And if you know a little bit about the book, I'll give you a quick synopsis. It's about a a lawyer in New York who's a real asshole. And I mean that literally and figuratively. Um, He winds up having a heart attack in the the courtroom and decides that he needs to get his life in order. He's overweight, miserable, bad attitude, basically uh, sells his Ferrari, goes up to the top of the Himalaya Mountains, comes back a year later tan 100 pounds less um and during the course of the book as it's laid out one of the monks up there told him that in every human life you generally see 25,000 sunrises and sunsets and julian battle you know never said anything about it in the book and i stopped at that point in the book because one of the things that really caught me and i thought you know i think in my entire life at that point at 40 years old i think i'd only seen maybe 25 to 40 sunrises and it just kind of caught me and then i started thinking about when he came back and started talking to his friends you know how they remarked how tan he was and this and that and i said how's he gonna get tan and the himalaya mountains on the top and then i thought about the sherpas and how they were tan and how physically fit they were and then i started to realize well there was a link the link was actually the latitude where the himalayas were and the altitude And I realized that there was a tie to UV light. And one thing led to another. I went back to the medical school library at Vanderbilt at the time for 18 months and researched then the six papers. You see, the six papers initially weren't enough to motivate me. But the book was because I I actually put some things together that the book had mentioned. And this book is not a a true story. It's a fable. You know, it's a story. And I, I thought to myself, is it possible that what's in this book actually is really possible biologically. And I found out that it was, and part of the whole story was actually leptin. Um, And I laid that out, you know, in a thesis format, came up with something called the quilt document, decided after talking to a couple of doctors that I'd put it on the internet and 
fast forward 15, 16 years, and here we are. It's a pretty cool story. Always gets me. So you started with leptin at the at the blogs in the blogs and well i didn't I, i'm gonna tell you when i say i started with leptin let's take it back to where y- you guys were i'm talking about you and your listening audience i knew that if i was to explain what i found in leptin in that 18 months or what i thought about when i was at the foot of michelangelo's statue when i put it all together and i saw the blinding light and the bird on the top I immediately realized that leptin was a floor for a protein. In other words, it absorbs light at 220 nanometers. So the light and leptin actually link together. But when I first started talking about leptin to you guys, I talked about it from the biochemical or mechanistic approach. I didn't talk about from the photochemistry because I realized immediately, um, just as your podcast is called the light, uh, what did you call it? The light? Yeah, the light diet. That's actually what leptin is a marker for. It's actually uh, a hormone that actually codifies electromagnetically uh, all the energy balance in your body in this one protein that goes from your sub-Q fat up until your hypothalamus. And I knew that if I talked about that 15 years ago, people would think that was batshit crazy. Why? Because nobody realized truly how leptin worked at that time. There was a lot of people out there in the PhD science world that were publishing papers, but nobody was really putting all these things together. And I certainly knew, like the things back then, to give you a kind of a, I guess, a bird's eye view of what really was the state of science back then, uh, nobody could figure out why in the hell God or evolution put leptin in your sub-Q fat. And, And that was the hormone that would control everything. I mean, it just kind of blew people's minds and I figured it out pretty damn quick because I knew that if it was on the sub-key fat, I also knew something about terrestrial sunlight, that terrestrial sunlight actually penetrated our skin, our sub-key fat and our arteries. And I said, you know, this makes a lot of sense. And then I thought it started thinking about, because I am a neurosurgeon, the skin and the brain actually come from the same Uh, tissue in an embryo called neuroectoderm or ectoderm and it made total sense to me and then I started seeing all the other links I started realizing that vitamin D and vitamin A are the neurosteroids that actually link the skin and the brain in biochemical form and they're actually they they actually are yoked with each other in fact they protect each other from each other's toxicity and that's when I realized oh wait a minute leptin is in the sub-Q fat I knew there had to be another photoreceptor in the fat. I didn't find out what that photoreceptor was, as you know, until 2017, late in 2017 when it was melanopsin. And when I, as soon as I knew that it was another photoreceptor and it was an opsin, that was where the vitamin D and vitamin A story came full circle. Um, because when melanopsin gets damaged, the vitamin A gets liberated and that destroys photoreceptors. And it turns out leptin is a photoreceptor. So is melatonin. That's the one you're interested in, you know, with your glasses and with the blue light. But I guess if you go back and look at my original blog, I tried to explain this as much as I could without overwhelming people with biochemistry and overwhelming people with photochemistry because I knew where people were at that time was really food and exercise. That's where the paleo movement was at that time. In fact, that's where they still are. They're still clueless. Uh, about some of the things that we've already talked about in this, you know, short little introduction. Uh, and they still are talking about the same bullshit today that they were talking about 15 years ago, you know? Yep, I'm with you. All right. The storms are brewing. It was a valiant effort <laughs> to be outdoors. I'm going to be uh, sliding back to my comfy, my comfy recluse, hoping my Ethernet cable makes it. Hell yeah. All right, I'm with you. I take it you're going to edit this? Well, sometimes it's actually good to keep it raw, but I could. Huh? 
sometimes it's actually good to let it be raw. So I'm not like totally intent on editing it because it was only about 10 seconds. So people could see, I tried to weather, see now that I'm inside, this is a good conversation point that we can get to eventually windows, even though, well, how about this? I have an open window on that side of the room. So do you think I should keep them off? Uh, the thing is, look what you're, what's sitting behind you. Yeah. It's closed window. All right. And so that means it's technically your blue light toxic there. Plus yeah. you got the blue light, unless you have Iris on your screen. So there's I've, probably benefit to you wearing the day walkers right now. And I'm sure some people probably out there are asking, you know, Hey, should we get into this right now? Since we just started talking about light, but I'm going to take you back to what we just talked about. I, we got back into the melanopsin story when vitamin A gets liberated, destroys the photoreceptors. Everybody knows about, you know, leptin and, and melatonin and all the other ones that I talk about ad nauseum. But I think what people need to realize is that vitamin A, when it gets liberated, lowers your vitamin D by design. So it actually creates a huge problem in your body. And believe it or not, when vitamin D drops, what do you need to know? Because let's face it, the current events right now globally, the reason why you're in Idaho is because of coronavirus. And what people don't realize is that um, just wearing blue blockers on your eyes has two major effects on your immune system. And this may blow some people's minds, but it's tied to this leptin melanopsin story. Um, Sunlight, terrestrial sunlight on your skin and your eyes, what are the two things that it does? It actually raises innate immunity. What does innate immunity do in the immune system? It actually protects you from viral attack, meaning the virus getting into your cells. But here's the one that very few people talk about. It actually is an immunosuppressive to the adaptive system. The adaptive system is the one where you're worried about antibody responses, you're worried about natural killer cells and T cells. And the reason why you want that down, let's just talk about the current disease that's out there. What do we all know? We know people with shitty vitamin D levels who are or have dark skin or, or obese because they're leptin resistant are getting taken to the woodshed by C19. Now, thankfully, most people out there aren't those people. But why is this happening? Well, what do you, what did you also hear about on social media? Because most of you, you know, are internet doctors anyway. Because you you're not on the front line. You heard about these cytotoxic storms that would put people into the ICU, get intubated. Well, it turns out, how do you get cytotoxic storms when your adaptive immune system is suppressed? Okay, and your innate immune system doesn't work. How do you get that from a liberated vitamin A in your blood? and from having really low vitamin Ds. All the people that are the risk um, market for COVID-19 all have those issues in common, as well as other people with mitochondrial diseases. But this is the reason why I could make the case that every ICU that's treating C19 patients probably should hand out purple and red lights and probably a pair of blue blocking glasses. So just to confirm, so you want people to get sunlight because that's improving their innate immune system and also improving their adaptive immune system so it's not suppressed, right? right? Well, no, you, you want the adaptive one suppressed. Why? Because that's what limits the cytotoxic storms. Gotcha. See, that's what turns down that part. See, everybody thinks that sunlight raises both. It doesn't. And it's kind of funny in the functional medicine world – I think they forget about that. And the reason why this is a really important point for people to hear, that's the reason why autoimmune conditions are so prevalent in people that don't get enough sunlight. Because it turns out it's the adaptive side that's really screwed up. It's not the innate side. And it's also um, another reason why many people with autoimmunity have viruses in their body. That's the reason why a lot of them get Lyme disease. And nobody seems to realize it. Everybody wants to blame it on some kind of bullshit that Dr. Klinghart talks about or, or someone else talks about. Why? Because nobody gets to the core issue of really what's going on. And it actually ties back to that leptin story that I told you 16 years ago. And you know, Matt, that I get aggravated when people spew half-truths because half-truths always lead to full lies. And, you know, some of the things that these alternative health practitioners are out there hawking to people really doesn't work. Um, you're going to spend a lot of money 
on stuff out there that really doesn't work. And if you just realize, and this is what I've been saying about the C-19 issue, if you just get out in the sun, it's probably the best vaccine instead of waiting around for Dr. Fauci's vaccine that's going to be fraught with a myriad of problems. Um, if you understand truly how terrestrial sunlight works with our immune system, then you'll understand why you want to be out in the sun and why when you're on the Internet, like so many people are being brought in, you need to have a really good pair of blue blocking blast glasses to protect your immune system um, from, I guess the best way to put it is a, a decline in your battery, because that's really what your colony of mitochondria are. Yep. Could we go back to that origin story? So you said the paleo people are full of bullshit. I'd, I'd like to hear you recount the story of your year one experience at the paleo conference and kind yeah. of what you said and what the response was there. Well, after having my light bulb moment or my come to Jesus moment or Eureka moment about leptin, I knew that this was antithetical to allopathic medicine. So I knew they weren't going to be the place that I could actually facilitate change. So what did I do? I looked out on the Internet to see who were the people that probably had an open mind and also uh, had a strong history to evolutionary biology. And at that time, it was the paleo movement. And I said, you know, this may be a good place to actually join in here and tell them, look, I think what you guys are doing is great. It's good that you're getting people taking that one step in the right direction, but they didn't go far enough as far as I'm concerned, which is the reason why when one of their movement leaders, Mark Sisson, asked me to write a book, um, he told me what his idea would be for my book. And I listened, you know, and I said, well, I've got a, another game plan. Um, and um, after a couple of things happened that year, um, with some of the people that were movement leaders there where they actually decided to go after me in um, a pretty hellacious way, you know, with um, a cruise ship phone call and pulling me off a cruise ship and getting the FBI involved. I decided um, I was going to take things in my own hand and I was going to teach them a lesson and I was going to show them just how ignorant they really were. I was going to show them instead of working with them, I decided I was going to teach them a lesson. And hopefully that lesson has infected a lot of other people, because I think right now in the paleo movement, uh, the only reason that they talk about light and circadian biology is because of me. And I know you know this, too, Matt, because you showed up to a talk with Dominic D'Agostino, who's a big keto head and researcher down in Florida. And you showed up at the same meeting when Rob Wolf was there and you had Fritz Hallwich's book and you posed a really good question that Rob couldn't really answer. And, you know, he's a PhD biochemist researcher. And I was kind of glad that happened because I was kind of hoping it would point out to his followers that he's only got part of the story right. And you know how I feel about parts of truths. Yep. I don't like them. Well, he even answered actually at that time that he thinks circadian biology may be more important than food, which was kind of funny because. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. And that's exactly what they made fun of me for, you know, almost 10 years ago at the Paleo FX conference. Yeah, it's really interesting. I want to kind of work more. I want to work more through your history and the story as things started to evolve, because I, I would say, you know, I kind of got interested just before you really started to drive the sunlight bomb home like crazy. Obviously, you know, I, re I was rereading the quilt recently and I, I don't remember exactly which Livy it was one of the first five levies of the quilt, even one of the first three, was talking about sunlight and how sunlight's essential. Uh, it was at least mentioned. So you went from the quilt, and then you got into the leptin series, and then you, you got into, well, you know, while we're on the subject of leptin, let's, I'd like to talk about a little bit more on that. You know, you're describing how it's a fluorophore protein and it signals from the fat to the brain, but could you explain, like, really what's causing leptin resistance for people today, like where their brain isn't registering the signal anymore, so they yes, eat like crazy the, and get fat? It's actually the photochemical signal uh, is not properly programmed into the aromatic rings uh, of leptin, and the way the photoelectric effect works in us is actually not that difficult to understand. Light excites electrons, electrons get raised energy levels, 
uh, most of the aromatic amino acids that we have release uh, their light usually at nighttime. And that's actually when leptin works. Gets into the brain around midnight, into the uh, leptin uh, melanocortin system, which is what I talked about in the cold thermogenesis four, five, and six blogs. And it gives its electromagnetic barcode, which is very similar to why you called your podcast what you called it. And that information has got to be distributed to the brain so that it knows precisely what the energy balance is. Well, it turns out leptin has to have another photoreceptor in order for it to work. I mean, you know, remember how I always talk to people about everything in biology is a coupled system. You have a negative and positive feedback loop. Leptin's part of that feedback loop. The other part for us is actually melanopsin. And if one or other of those coupled systems is bad, what did I tell you, Matt, when you were down at the uh, the Cancun talk with me with the ophthalmologist? That any time I actually showed a video of what happened when we took the wolf, the predator, out of Yellowstone Park, you actually extinguish both sides of the system. So if you extinguish either the positive or negative feedback loop, what happens? You wind up getting diseases yeah. tied to leptin resistance. And one of those diseases happens to be obesity. There's plenty of other ones, but that's kind of how it really starts. And that's the reason why God and evolution put melanopsin and leptin in our sub-Q fat, uh, put melanopsin in our uh, arterioles in our fat, put it in our skin. It's uh, in our eye. Uh, that's the one that you know you focus the most in on with your glasses. But once you see the unbelievable photochemistry that's at play that drives us, you've got to come back to yourself and sit down with a guy like, say, Cresser, Wolf, or even Mark Sisson and say, look, you guys have been selling this food and exercise bullshit story for so long. How about you explain for X? Because the science has rapidly expanded in the last 10 years, but what you guys are talking about hasn't. So you got to start scratching your head and go, if you're a Joe Q public, say, do I want these guys packing my parachute? You know, is this good enough for me, especially considering that our environment in the last 10 years has gone from 1G to 5G? And we know that not only does blue light ruin leptin resistance or melanopsin function, but so does non-native EMF. Why? Because that vitamin A has a weak covalent bond between melanopsin and the opsin protein there, and that's what causes the problem. That's often why I've told you that the worst non-native EMF that we had to deal with for a long time was really blue light. And a lot of people don't think about blue light like non-native EMF, but that's what it is. You know, it's not designed to be present. Uh, there's no blue light. Blue light is always protected by the UV that's present during the day and also by the 40, I should say by the 42% of infrared A and near infrared light. Um, and I, I remember even when you were younger, you asked me a question one time about the, the wiring diagram for the inner mitochondrial membrane. You couldn't wrap your head around actually how red light and blue light really caused humongous problems in the mitochondria. That's when I turned you on to Doug Wallace. And that's when I, I told you, I want you to understand this. You know, you would think guys like Rob Wolf and Mark Sisson, who are food gurus, would really understand, you know, the analogy that I gave you and my members about, does it matter what kind of gas you put in a Ferrari that has a bad engine? Or does it matter more to make sure that the engine always stays primed? And when you actually get the essence of that discussion, you start to go, yeah, it makes way more sense to make sure that our colony of mitochondria is actually optimized. Well, guess what? What optimizes our mitochondrial biology? Let's cut to the chase. Melatonin does. And we just talked about melatonin. What destroys it the most? Blue light. How? Via melanopsin damage, which is linked to leptin resistance. And there are so many other food gurus out there that want to talk about insulin resistance. You can be insulin resistant and still not leptin resistant, that's why there's a lot of skinny diabetics out there, but there's also a lot of fat diabetics. Those are people that have both of the problems. And people don't realize that this system, because it's run photonically, if one little thing is out of whack, 
it can lead to a different disease. And I know the way I explained it to you the best in the past was through Wallace's work on heteroplasmy. I explained to you that natural aging goes up 10% every decade, and that's why we age. In other words, nobody's getting off this planet by doing any biohack, you know, staying alive forever. Like what Aubrey de Grey, Aubrey de Grey believes, Jack Cruz doesn't believe. We're not going to live to a thousand years ever. Why? Because the system is not built for that. We have a zero-sum game. And what that zero-sum game is, Matt, I've talked to you about this too, and I don't know if you remember it. Cleaver's power laws. It turns out that an elephant and a mouse, they, they live radically different lengths of life, but they have the exact same amount of heartbeats in it. So guess what the cool thing is? Um, your resting metabolic rate links to longevity. And it's a zero-sum game. You can't add or subtract to it. The only way you can is if we can improve mitochondrial biology. That's the reason Jack fundamentally disagrees with Aubrey de Grey. Why? Because he doesn't know enough about mitochondria. He actually believes, as a transhumanist would believe, that if we can do something to affect the cytochrome proteins that cause this problem, maybe we can do something with it. It turns out anytime we do something to that system – we get collateral effects that lead to many other problems. And the problem is we're not smart enough yet to get there. I guess people out there that that like Dave Asprey and like Ben Greenfield and like R.B. DeGray keep on a tinker with the fucking system until they think they're smarter than Mother Nature. My tribe, I teach you about mitochondrial biology so you understand how ludicrous it is to take a pill – and think that you're going to fix a quantum problem. So someone says to you, obesity is caused because you eat too much carbohydrates and you don't exercise enough. You know, that's the, the standard. That could be true. Paradigm. That could be true. That could be true if the person goes out and works uh, in a gym with blue light or eats carbohydrates out of season. But see, the problem is when the person says that, tell me the context. And, you know, here's the corollary to that. You know this. I told you in Vermont 2016 from the stage that if Western A. Price was alive, he'd be a mitochondria. Why? Because everybody that he studied, when he talked about their ancestral diet, they ate outside. And there was no electromagnetic pollution around. Guess what? They did it the right way. And that's part of the reason I don't have a problem with them. But I have a, a problem with them because they're also trying to tell people, well, if you ate – like they did in the 1900s and the 1930s, you'll be fine. Wrong answer, because that environment is gone. It's it's never coming back. Um, the environment that we're in now has probably more radically changed since 1940 than at any other time in human history. And I don't see it going back. Yeah. Could you do a bit of an overview? You have the CT series, cold thermogenesis, and the brain gut series in your blog, which when I first read them, they, I was totally floored more by the CT series because of what you described with, you know, the mammal ancestor, the development of the leptin melano, mel, melanocortin pathway, but could you kind of skim over both of those? I know one's a lot older than the other in our evolutionary history and how that sort of ties and relates to our evolution into the species we are today and, and sort of you know, yeah, you, need a, you need a whole podcast really just on that, to be honest with you, because I have to tell you, you're making the assumption that the audience a, is facile with the science and understands it. Um, but believe it or not, well, the I'll original, say, I think most I'm going to tell you this, the original, not, they, they, people would be interested in this stuff. And I think we should be doing like an, one interview a month. I want you to keep that mic and we can go through this stuff. But I think people need to know about the, the factor X that you talked about that, you know, you haven't really brought up in a long time. And how that relates, and how the vi the viral, g you know, genome sort of led to right. human evolution initially, and that that progression. If you could almost take us through the progression from the ancient ancestor through to the development of the human from the ape, because you know that better than anyone else, I think does, or yeah, as far as I know, and you almost don't talk about that very often. But I think people would be fascinated because you got still people thinking. For example, you still have people out there who argue that the reason humans evolved from apes was because they got access to eating organ meats. From yeah, that's total. That, well, that's the paleo guys. Well, please, no, no. Those, that's total bullshit. Here. 
It's, well, it's actually total bullshit. That, because guess what? These are people that don't go far enough in their thinking. Uh, if that's the case, if that truly is the case, let's just stop there. Let's make this a very easy thought experiment. Why the fuck isn't lions like humans? Because that's all they eat. Uh, all cats are oblig obligate carnivores. So that means that humans should have came from cats. But you know what? They didn't. They came from a species that predominantly is herbivore but does eat meat. That We know that there's – the great apes do eat meat occasionally. They just don't do it a lot. Well, the story really begins, and this is going to be like the fastest evolutionary biology lecture you're ever going to get. Uh, there's three kingdoms of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. On the planet, 3.8 billion years ago when life first began, uh, in the thermal vents that were driven by the light of the sun, you basically set up a system – where photochemicals and uh, lipids formed the lipid bilayer, the ATPase formed via quantum biologic effects that I cover in detail in the organization structural uh, series. I think the blog that it was, OSF3. Um, and I go through how the ATPase was likely formed. Eventually, life was on Earth very, very simple for up until about 650 million years ago, and then something really big happened. Um, 650 million years ago, that's when chlorophyll started to show up in plants, uh, especially the algae in the sea. And the chlorophyll actually made very complex chemicals. Those complex chemicals were DHA. DHA meaning the fish oil version. The first type, however, was an algae. And this exploded in growth. All throughout the oceans, then fifty million. Why was that? Well, even before that, you skipped the mitochondrial merger that led to no. The mitochondrial like merger is coming fifty oh, really? million years later. All right. Wow. So chloroplasts come first. Really. And then, and then fifty. Yeah, we had flowering plants and trees for fifty million years before there was any really? huge. I didn't know that. Gas. Why did that spike in uh, chlorophyll in the ocean or algae in the ocean happen? Was that UV light related? Yes. Uh, and that goes back to more science, different branch, geology and, and astrobiology. Uh, our sun is a G-class star. Most people don't know that uh, because they never seem to ask the questions. But what happens with a G-class star? They usually live 10 billion years. Well, guess what? 650 million years ago, we're in midlife we went through a midlife crisis with our G-class star. What generally happens to G-class stars that we know from physics? They increase their uh, intensity, their luminosity, by about 10 to 15 percent, generally by releasing UV light. And guess what? That was the key. And for those of you who are evolutionary biology freaks, you know that one of the things that has always not jazzed with Darwin's theory of evolution is that he talks about gradual mutations show up and life comes. But what he can't figure out is why all 32 phyla of complex life showed up on Earth relatively at the same time. And that was at the Cambrian explosion. And it turns out that occurred 50 million years after this change. And the reason why is because what happened at the Cambrian explosion, not only did you get complex life, but you had the fusion event and this is what Lynn Margolis, Nick Lane talks about. They believe that it was a bacteria in archaea. Jack doesn't believe that, just so we're clear. Jack believes that it was either an archaea or in a bacteria and a virus. So that should really get people interested why Jack believes that. But we'll get to that down the road. So anyway, the fusion event from this increased radiation from the star leads to the formation of mitochondria. Mitochondria were then usurped by certain archaea or bacterial cells infected with viruses because where do viruses grow? Most people didn't know that. In the Brain Gut 2 blog called Viral Marketing, I talked about how UV light uh, has a massive effect on viruses when it's in seawater. Uh, and that amplification led to more complex life. And basically what happened is the mitochondria was made a bitch slave. And 
its its genome was decreased tremendously to about 37 genes, where only 13 genes deal with uh, energy uh, transport function. And eventually, all complex life literally showed up on planet Earth at that moment. And for those of you who don't believe this, you can go look it up because it's true. <laughs> it's it, We know from the fossil history, life showed up on Earth literally overnight. For almost three and a half billion years, we were very simple. We were bacteria and um, archaea. And as Matt knows from the cold thermogenesis series, I actually said because – Life was that simple that we evolved wakefulness, that the default state of life actually is sleep. That's awesome. And that, that kind of freaked people out when I said it in the CT series. But I tried to explain why. Life didn't really need to move around when the only thing that was driving, you know, it's an energy gradient across a membrane was actually fucking sunlight. You didn't need to move around because it was always present every 22 to 24 hours. And the reason I say 22 to 24 hours, because 3.8 billion years ago, the moon was closer to the earth. So the earth's rotation was faster. And how do we know that even today? Because we can see the answer in the, the, the skeleton fossils of coral, because they spawn. And that's how we figured out uh, that was the case. And it turns out the moon moves away from the sun Six, six inches or six centimeters every year. And that actually changes the speed of the rotation of the Earth. So technically, um, even a day on the life of Earth changes every year. But it's an imperceptible degree, but it does happen. And it does have an effect on life on the planet. Um, so basically what happens after we get the mitochondria, life gets more and more complex. Why? Because mitochondria become amplified in cells. So the simple cells- Can I ask you real quick, how many mitochondria do you think the initial cells had? Because Doug Wallace says now it's thousands per cell. No, I think it was a couple. I think, and there's even some, there's even some pretty good data in Nick Lane's books where he talks about uh, a bacteria. I can't remember the name of it. It begins with a P and it sounds like paramecium, but- they we still have them on planet Earth. They only have one or two mitochondria in them, and because you know he calls it Luca. Luca is the last uh, universal common ancestor. I think correct, and that's been his whole you know, I guess reason to be to try to figure that out. Um, the bottom line is, uh, for me, to me, the way life began was totally quantum biology, one hundred percent. And I do cover that uh, in terms of uh, redox potential and quantum effects. You have to have a proper understanding of redox chemistry to understand how quantum biology works through building blocks. It's a very complex story. It actually ties to information theory, which I got into much later in the Patreon blogs when I got into the quantum thermodynamics blogs and talked about um, – the guys who worked at Bell Labs uh, who came up with uh, some of those theories. I mean, the, the guy that I'm thinking off the top of my head is Alan Turing. Alan Turing's the one that figured out the original paper in 1951 on morphogenesis. It's not even the paper he's the most famous for, but it's the paper I think he should have been most famous for. And that actually led to the guys at Bell Labs that came up with uh, information theory and actually computational biology. Um, and all that stuff now is being used for quantum computer build up. But, you know, I don't want to get off on a tangent on it because that's going to throw people off. But honestly, if you just go read the OSF three blog, it'll blow your mind how I show you how redox changes build complex proteins. And that's the original building blocks. But you had to have something to power all this shit. It turns out that's what mitochondria do. And mitochondria create huge amounts of power. Why? Because they have small little membranes and it turns out the way electricity works from light or from any other source, any kind of plasma, is it's six microns big. So it turns out that across that membrane with those respiratory proteins, uh, and this is in Nick Lane's book, for those of you who are going to shit when I tell you this number, one mitochondria creates a voltage change of 30 million volts across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So that's 
That's that's a lot to, of bolts. It's equivalent to a uh, uh, a massive bolt of lightning. That's pretty okay? dope. So when you think about it, you have in say some simple neurons, like some of the neurons in the leptin melanocortis system, you have about thirty six hundred to six thousand mitochondria per neuron. You go holy when you do the math, you do thirty million volts times that many mitochondria. You go, that's a lot of power. That explains the reason why the brain can run on such low power density because it's taking full advantage of all the lipid membranes in your body to generate this voltage. And it turns out lipids make or are electromagnetic capacitors. That's exactly what they are. That's why DHA is such a huge part of the story. And I've told you many, many times that DHA is the only polyunsaturated fat that has never been replaced in evolutionary history one time in excitable membranes, meaning the brain. And people didn't believe that when I said it, especially in the paleo community. It kind of shocked them. And I said, well, all you need to do is go read Stephen Cunane's book or um, Sir Michael Crawford, and the answers are all there. The problem is y'all haven't put it together. And I try to tell people, the only reason to eat grass-fed meat, guess what's in grass? DHA, okay? But there's a shit ton more DHA in seafood. And it turns out the type that's in seafood is really important for us, for our mammals, because it turns out the stuff that's in green plants actually is usually in the SN1 or SN3 position. What does that mean for people who don't know any biochemistry? The glycerol backbone of all fats has three carbons. First one is SN1. Bottom one is SN3, the middle is SN2. Turns out the only lipids that can get into the human peripheral and, and central nervous system are those in the SN2 position. So we have a prejudice to that. So that's the reason why we need fish to eat the algae to turn it into SN2. That's the reason why being a vegan is not so wise. That's the reason why eating vegan DHA a la Matt Blackburn, you need to stay away from guys that talk bullshit because they're not giving you the true story. So why is this all tied um, back to this thing that Matt brought up earlier called Factor X? Well, Factor X is actually where the age of dinosaurs ended and the mammals this is the best began. story ever. I'm so stoked. So Bring it to, bring it to town. <laughs> so most people know that I'm a big fan of Mexico. Most people probably don't really know why. Matt happens to know why. Um, about 65 million years ago, a six-mile-wide asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out life on this planet. Let's be clear. It didn't wipe it all out, uh, but it did a pretty damn good job. And it's called the fifth extinction event. And how did we find out that this happened? There was a lot of geologic evidence that it happened, but the main bit of evidence came in the early 1990s, right around when leptin was discovered, was that we have an iridium band. That's an element on the periodic table, symbol IR, and it's called the KT boundary. Every place you dig, anywhere in the, anywhere in the world, that includes Antarctica, we found it there too, has a boundary where there's never been one dinosaur found below it. And it turns out, above it, all you see is mammals. And it turns out, that's where your ancestors came from. You came from that event. And the reason why they were able to take over was because when the asteroid hit, it was likely when they were hibernating underground. And we believe, we don't know this to be true, but we believe that photosynthesis was interrupted, food chains were interrupted for some time. Uh, the estimates I have read in papers goes all the way from one year all the way to a thousand years. I don't know, and I'm not gonna speculate how long it was, but I will tell you this. It was not long enough to wipe everything out on the planet, but it was long enough to favor animals that had high mitochondrial capacity. Who are those mammals? Those are every mammal on the planet today. Who is the only other animal to really make it through? There was one dinosaur that did make it through. They're called theropod dinosaurs. They are today's modern birds. And how do we know that? Modern birds have the same exact hip joint as dinosaurs. And it turns out theropod dinosaurs all, all have something else in common. They can fly. And it turns out to disconnect from the earth and fly in the sun 
you need to have high mitochondrial capacity, which is the reason why birds can do what they do. And it's also the reason why birds are so long living because they have huge mitochondrial capacity. Well, it turns out, as I mentioned earlier to Matt about Kleber's power law, most people know mice and rat are nocturnal mammals. They don't live very long. They only live a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Well, it turns out elephants live a lot longer. Well, it turns out the main difference is their mitochondrial capacity and their basal metabolic rate. Turns out you happen to be the mammal. Humans are the mammal that have the lowest metabolic rate. That's why they live the longest, provided they mine their mitochondria and their colony of mitochondria by remaining connected to Earth and to the sun uh, on the planet as best as possible. That's really the entire thesis about evolutionary biology. Amazing. So there's more. There's more. So when, when oh, there's a lot of details I left out, but I mean, that is as quick an overview as I can give you. That's pretty good. When it comes to the CT series and the, the CT benefit that humans and, and essentially all mammals can get, does that initially descend from the extinction event? No, it descends. It, it starts immediately 3.8 billion years ago about the story I told you about redox chemistry. And it turns out redox chemistry always works better when it's cooler. And you have to remember, I told you this story a long time ago. And I know a lot of this stuff comes into your head and flies out of your head because you don't realize how important it is. Maybe that's why this is important to talk about. Remember what I told you that's in Nick Lane's book that the closer the respiratory proteins are together, the better the quantum tunneling is. And when the angstrom is split apart, it, it's a logarithmic effect. It's not a linear effect. So you lose energy production tremendously. So what does cold thermogenesis functionally do to the respiratory proteins, which are cytochrome 1, 2, 3, 4, and the ATPase? It brings them closer together. You want that, that whole complex from 1 through 5 to be within 48 to 60 angstroms. We know that from new science that's been done by people who are mitochondriacs. Uh, it turns out when you have diseases and heteroplasmy is higher, they're spread out. And that's exactly what the stimulus is for apoptosis. Most people know that apoptosis is controlled by cytochrome 4. What happens is there's a whole I don't sequence. Think most of people actually know that. <laughs> well, I mean, they should. They should. Because what happens is the mitochondria swells, and the swelling opens up mitochondrial pores. Uh, one of those chemicals that people probably have heard of is cardiolipin. Uh, and what does that do? It basically takes apart um, cytochrome, 4, uh, cytochrome C oxidase, and it leads to a cascade of events uh, that's called apoptosis. Now, if it doesn't go fully, it can lead to fission. It can lead to fusion. There's a lot of different things that it can lead to. But that's functionally how it happens. But it, it tells you, again, we're back to quantum thermodynamics. Most people don't realize that the tunneling of electrons requires a, a precise distance between the two. And I've taught people ad nauseum. Matt, you remember how many times that I show you the chemical structure of chlorophyll and hemoglobin. When you look at them, they're identical. The atomic spacing is identical. The only difference is that there's magnesium in the center of chlorophyll. And there's iron in the center of, of your red blood cell hemoglobin. And why, why is that a big difference? Magnesium is atomic number 12. Iron is atomic number 26. What does that mean? You got 14 more electrons. What does that mean? Get more light so you can be more complex. Now you're back to the light diet again. That's, that's how this works. Everything about you is light. So and you know what? We got to get people to understand it is about light. We got to get people, even in the payload community, I don't want to like ostracize them and make fun of them. I want them to learn this shit. This, just, this shit is amazing. Matt, you remember how many times I talked to you when I told you that every single cell releases extreme low frequency UV light? Nobody in the paleo community talks about that. It's true. When I showed you the book and I, it stimulates mitosis, right? You go, wait a minute, this is what stimulates. This is the stimulus that a cell uses to divide. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, and and the talk of how the cells leak the light when we're right. stressed, and then when we die, it all leaks out. Like 
the, the soul almost. It's very interesting. So people will say, as you know, that CT is hormetic because it stresses your body. You're saying it's biophysical, right? It's not hormetic. That's what that's they got that from Rob Wolf. That is total bullshit. It's actually it's actually I'm going to tell you uh, fundamental. Um, it can be hormetic for people who are like Rob Wolf, but it's not uh, for other people. That's part of the reason why, you know, I put it out there about Wim Hof. You know, I don't usually talk too much about Wim Hof because I think he does a lot of things wrong. But one of the things that I like to point out the reason why he got away being a vegan and smoking for so long is because he was actually doing CT. And that's that's not a hormetic effect. That's that's a longevity effect. And what people don't realize is cold also has a, a huge function on your thyroid function, which I talked about in CT four and six. And it has a humongous effect on your immune system, both the innate and adaptive system. And that's what you know, um, both Wim and I tried to prove to people when we did our experiments, like the one that he did with our MRSA and the one that I actually uh, did as well. But the problem is Wim has never gotten the science down ice cold. You know, he's really good about teaching people how to do CT. Uh, he tells people that a lot of it is tied to his breathing. I don't believe that at all. His breathing technique breaks the Bohr and Haldane effect, but I don't really talk about it publicly because I want people to actually embrace what he's teaching because what he's teaching people to embrace the cold is a good thing. It's always a good thing, okay? Uh, certain people it'll work better for, and you know that because of what I taught you about Wallace. People who have uncoupled haplotypes tend to do better with cold. People who have L0, L1, or L3, which are African people, they, they don't like cold that much. Why? Because they're better adapted to terrestri strong terrestrial sunlight with shit tons of UV and their environments have to be light stable. What does light stability mean between the Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer? You know, when they go outside of that, they tend to develop mitochondrial diseases. That's another reason why we've seen this with COVID-19. People with dark skin who live at high latitudes are the people that got taken to the woodshed by this virus. And the irony is, what solves the virus problem, Matt? UV light. Yep. Imagine that. Amazing. So speaking of UV light, to part two of the lesson of evolutionary biology, in the Brain Gut series, you explain how viral DNA was essential part of the human brain development. And you talk about the change in the losing of the hair, the changing in the ankle bones, the standing upright, everything, the opening of the, the chest. You know, could you step people through? Could you walk through that actual evolution process and just... It, ta it would take... That one would take way too long. The, the, the thing that I would just tell do you... do it. Yeah, no, I think it would take way, way too long. You can I mean, the evolutionary summary. biology thing would be... That was hard enough. This would be... I mean, I it took major blogs that are over 10,000 words to get this done. I mean, I think people need to go read Brain Gut 1 through 5 to get the whole story. That's literally, Matt, that's f almost 50 to 70,000 words. Yeah, it's that's like almost a, a book. multiple books. Yeah. Well, why yeah. don't you tease people a little bit so they go and read the Brain Gut series? Because I think a lot of people aren't reading these blogs. Well, you're not. I, I got on your case about <laughs> It's true, though. I'm reading them. I'm not reading the old ones now, but I'm I'm going back through from the beginning right now. But but I think I think though the thing is that's important about this podcast that maybe people will realize because we're living through COVID nineteen. I'm hoping that you and maybe other people listening to this will say, "Shit, all that stuff that he wrote ten or fifteen years ago actually is making a difference right now. It's making a big difference, and that's what I've said on my member Q and As, and you know that." Everybody said to me, are you pessimistic about this? I said, no, I think when the dust settles from this C-19, people are going to realize if you're a black swan mitochondriac, the science is coming to me now, dude. It's totally coming to me. You know, you don't see anybody behind uh, Trump talking about how diet and exercise is going to solve your C-19 problem. But you did have Trump up there and the head of health and human resources say, you know what we found out? UV light really works good. And we had Fauci, Redfield, and Burks radio silence on it. Why? Because that's not what they want you to know. 
They want you to know about their immunotherapy that they can patent so they can make money on it. Okay, the one that I'm selling you is right out there. It's free. You need to learn how to use it properly by building your solar callus. And I teach people how to do that on Patreon too. All the pieces are there. Remember, Matt, when I said when we went up to, to Vermont, we started off with the tool song, right? Schism. You have to know where the pieces fit because you've seen them fall apart. And that's what being a doctor really all is about. We take care of people who are falling apart. So if you think it's about diet and exercise only and you don't know about all this fancy schmancy photochemistry that's in, involved in us, um, how good is that person going to be back in your parish? That's a question for people listening to this to know. I personally think it should be every clinician's duty to know what we've talked about in this podcast now. And because you know that they don't do it, Matt, then I think the people that are listening to this podcast, they have a duty for themselves. If they care about themselves and their health, they need to know a little bit of this stuff. I still want to hear the evolutionary theory of human evolution, but I think a better way to ask about it is going to be people say that sunlight causes skin cancer and sunlight's bad for us. Obviously, we both know that that's BS, but I'd like you to explain to people how not only is the sun not just bad for us, but starting in equatorial Africa, could you at least touch on how light, water, and magnetism come together in the Amazon or the uh, the rift zone, East African, East African, African rift, rift zone yeah. to create the complexity of the human brain and how that tied to us losing our hair, why we lost our hair. And you didn't mention when you talked about apes that they do eat some meat, in particular yeah. seafood. You didn't really touch on that when you just a few minutes ago. So could you touch on that, how that process sort of came together at a high level and how that makes the idea that sun is cancerous just completely absurd? Well, I mean, those are two different stories, probably for two different times. The idea that the sun is cancerous actually came from artificial UV light that was originally used in the 1950s on babies born with jaundice. They put them in a UV light and the jaundice went away, but they also got something called retrolental hyperplasia. Why? Because remember, babies' lenses of their eyes allow tons of UV light in. So that's where the original idea came from, that UV light was toxic. But it turns out what the stupid ass doctors back then and researchers didn't realize, that UV light from the sun is never present by itself. It's always present with the other six parts of the rainbow. And the one that protects you from UV light is red light, both near infrared and infrared A. Those are the, the antidote to those things. But that's that answer. To get back to the East African Rift Zone, for those people who don't know, the cradle of humanity, like where we came from, is right there. And that occurred about two million years ago. The reason why it's important where this is located um, uh, is in uh, the tropics. It's not at the equator, but it's within the tropics, north latitude, probably around 9 to 15 degrees north. And it happens to be a place in Africa where there's three tectonic plates. Those three tectonic plates have constantly moved. And uh, we know this from geology. It's been massively changed over time. And it turned out that when the plates moved, there was a, a group of apes that were walled off from their forests. So they had no other place to go. It's kind of like being caught in an oasis after these things happen. And the only food that was left was seafood. And they started to eat the seafood. And then the next thing you know, they started to get smarter and smarter and smarter. And um, there was no trees in this area because they lived in a coastal environment. So part of the reason why one of the main differences between us and the apes, I, I don't think a lot of people know this, is that uh, apes don't have sweat glands on their feet. They don't have them on their hands either, but it turns out humans do. The reason why, apes are always connected to the planet, whether they're on the ground or up in the canopy, because they're holding on to trees. It turns out humans didn't have to do that. Um, humans have sweat glands in both places. Why? Because they're designed to be connected to the tectonic uh, plates on planet Earth. We're not big climbers. Uh, and the power we started to utilize way more photoelectric effect because 
we massively increased DHA in our body. What's the, the number one organ in the body that has DHA? It's the brain and the peripheral nervous system. What organ system specifically in the body? In fact, what tract in the body, the human body, has more DHA than any other? The central retinal pathways. Those are the pathways that, you know, you try to school Rob Wolf on with Fritz Hall, which is book, when he didn't know anything about it. And it turns out the reason why DHA is a real special chemical, it has 22 carbons in it, and those 22 carbons are all double bonded, and it means they have a pi electron cloud. So there's a shit ton of electrons. What did I tell you about the photoelectric effect? Light programs electrons. It excites them. So the more light you absorb, the more complex life can be. And that's what drove, that was the battery capacitor that actually physically drove the change in the body plan, and it happened very fast. Well, how do we know that it happened fast? All you have to do is go look at the fossil record. Literally, there's hardly any missing links for humans. It happened quick. And I lay all this out in Brain Gut 1 through Brain Gut 5. All the different evolutionary proof most of it comes from the bones. And people always ask, Jack, why is it that we can't find our missing missing links from our transition from ape to human? And I tell people it's pretty simple. Go take a bunch of bones, put it in a, uh, uh, say, a crab net, and leave it in the ocean and come back. And you'll see that seawater dissolves the bones. And the reason why is the apes that became human all lived on the coastline. That's the reason why we don't find them. I was going to ask you to bring that up because I remember reading that and it just completely floored me when people use the lack of bone evidence to try to discount the theory of evolution. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a freaking giant joke. But look, I always tell people when you know better, you do better. And I think the people who pack your parachutes, when you want to understand why I'm a black swan mitochondriac, and why I treat people the way I do, it actually is tied to this story. It's I've looked into this story extremely deeply, so you don't have to. Um, I don't have any problem talking about it because I've written about all this stuff. All the stuff that we're talking about now, I've written volumes on. So when people say, I don't have any proof, I give you cited proof in the sites on those blogs. Everything I told you today uh, is not Jack Cruz's opinion. It's all published. The problem is Jack's an innovator. He's taken all the science, put it together for you to see for yourself. And then you decide, do you want to stick with the food gurus or do you want to up your game? Yeah. So speaking of food gurus, I want to get you a little bit uh, annoyed here, but in a good way. So Ray Pete, a lot of people are talking about Ray Pete. A lot of your members go to Ray Pete. A lot of people come from Ray Pete to you. And he argues that omega 3s are all puff PUFAs, polyunsaturated oh. fats, are really bad for you. In particular, omega 3 is bad for you. And then yeah, it's going to be oxidized and it's going to cause you problems. And then yeah. you're going to get problems with lipofusin. Could you explain what lipofusin is and why these people are so worried about it and why it's, you don't it's think it's a, an issue? It's a. It's a, a, a waste product protein that's found in peroxisomes in our body uh, from um, cell membrane damage. It turns out DHA isn't the problem. DHA is always recycled. The problem with Pete has always been he's a really smart guy, but he's got this issue where he thinks omega-3s in the form of DHA are equivalent to omega-6s, and they're not. They're radically different. The body handles them differently. And the thing that Pete has never been able to explain, like this is Pete's big problem, and I mentioned this earlier, explain why DHA has never been replaced one time in 650 million years of mammalian evolution. Not once. And guess what? I'm fucking still waiting. I'm st it's still crickets, okay? But the crazy part is where he is right, omega-6s or omega-3s, outside of DHA can be a problem. Why? Because those fats are, are very, they're much more likely to be oxidized by different processes. Turns out the reason that doesn't happen in us is because we reserve our DHA and recycle it. Like one of the, the 
paths that I taught you about. It's called the Bazan loop in the eye. It's got a long loop and a short loop. That's an example in one organ system that has the highest level of DHA, how much we recycle it, okay? Um, if you recycle it, it never gets oxidized. But the other things that do get oxidized are the things in your lipid membrane. So when your lipid membranes break down, uh, then you can develop waste products from polyunsaturated fats, and they are a problem. Do I think that um, certain omega-3s and, and certain – uh, omega-6s are a problem when they're eaten to excess. I personally think that's one of the big problems with the modern uh, Western diet, along with deuterium. I think both of those things are probably germane there. But uh, Pete, Pete has never been able to explain that one effect. And there's not a mammal on this planet that can live without DHA in its brain or its uh, peripheral nervous system. So that's how you know it's special. Not only that, uh, we've got treatises written by Cunane and Michael Crawford that actually blow Ray Pete out of the water. It, it just shows you what a linear thinker he is about biochemistry because that's what he is. He's a biochemist like Rob Wolf. He doesn't get into it deep enough to understand why DHA has special privilege. So they also argue that, and this is just getting into the weeds, but that if you – don't eat sugar all the time, constantly throughout the day. Your body secretes cortisol, and then you start breaking down, you know, get into a, an, a catabolic state, and it's just a nightmare. Could you kind of explain why that's just, in your opinion, off? It's, it it's very simple. If you look at – this is where most people should look in a, a basic biochemistry book that Pete's supposed to know. Uh, one mole of glucose makes 36 ATP. One mole of palmitic acid, which is – uh, a fat makes 147. So if you're just a linear thinker, you say, uh, does it make more sense to make more ATP or less ATP in terms of disease? So if you're eating, like he likes to talk about eating uh, orange juice, I believe. Uh, if you're drinking orange juice loaded with fructose, do that your whole life. I think you can get away with that if you live inside the tropics. I've told you that that most people don't have a problem. But if you have mitochondrial damage uh, and you try to do that, lots of luck. So that's a really interesting subject that most people just, it's so far out of the ballpark. Like when you brought up eating the banana in the winter in Boston and the paleo people flipped on you. Could well, you I did that. I did that at the paleo FX conference. Uh, I can't even remember her name anymore. She was some psychiatrist from Boston who thought she shit ice cream. Um, and I told her from the stage, I said, if you think you can do that, you're an idiot. Emily Deans, that was her name. Um, uh, and I was like, it just go, went to show how little she really knew about mitochondrial biology. Uh, and uh, especially ignorant about circadian biology. And I've told you this many times, that that's really my main beef with the paleo guys. And, and when you accosted Rob Wolf and D'Agostino at that time, and he said what he said to you, I felt he was giving you lip service. I, I, it's nice that he said it, but it would be really nice to see him actually put rubber to the road and start to tell people maybe, maybe there's something to this. Because remember, the circadian mechanism actually controls some of the things that, that Rob and Ray P. talk about. You want to know how to get lipofusin really fast? Sit inside with fucking blue light on all the time and you'll get a lot of it because that forces your cell membranes to turn over constantly. You don't want that. You why, really don't. Why is that forcing the cell membranes to turn over constantly? Because that's ubiquitin marketing is what drives that. That's and ubiquitin marketing, ubiquitin marketing is, is actually tied to melanopsin damage. And I've got a whole series. I think there's 28 blogs. Ubiquitin 1 – to 29. You can go read it. And the thing is, that's why I said, these things are there. I put them out there for people to read. Uh, and these things can't be described simply in one little podcast. But that marking mechanism happens. You mark your proteins for replacement when your circadian mechanism is broken. Okay. And what people don't realize, how does the circadian story fit to DHA? Well, it turn, turns out the circadian mechanism of any kind of protein synthesis actually is linked through a G-coupled protein. 
G-coupled proteins also control the turnover of DHA, omega-6s, everything, phosphatidyl, inositol, choline, and serine in your lipid membranes. If it's off, you're going to turn over membranes faster. I mean, to, let's make this really simple for people to understand. I've told people that have SIBO or other problems with their gut uh, that the circadian mechanism is designed to turn over your enterocytes in your gut 24 to 48 hours. If your circadian mechanism is off, it doesn't happen. And guess what? That's the real problem where people start having problems with their gut. That's the first thing. It's funny you bring that up. That's actually the first thing I ever read or one of the first things I read of yours that got me thinking like, huh. And then I was buying UVEX blue blockers on Amazon the next day. Um, so that's really, I think, awesome for people to know about DHA and all that stuff. You brought up deuterium. There's a lot of stuff there. I really want to ask you about Gilbert Ling because you have mentioned him in your blog series. I don't recall which series it was where you – I think it was spread across multiple of the series. But it was. He is the guy, from my understanding, who – broke the sodium pump hypothesis of biology and was yeah. completely, you know, they're working on a documentary on him. It's been taking a long time. It hasn't come out yet. It's called on the back of a tiger, but apparently right. I hope it portrays him accurately. I do know Ray Pete is one of the people featured. So I'm hoping that doesn't, you know, maybe bias the, the, the facts they're sharing, but any, and Gerald Pollock's also there, which is going to be awesome. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't think Pete will pollute it. Pete, Pete will try to get his, his beliefs in, but really where Gilbert Ling um, comes in, really, he's the guy that is blowing up the chemoosmotic theory that Peter Mitchell won the Nobel Prize for. And I mean, why, why I respect Ling so much is he was, he was like the true scientist, like Wallace and Robert Becker. They went against the conventional wisdom grain. And one of the things that Ling kept studying is he was more interested in the energy side than the anatomy side. And it turns out that's the side you want to be on when you really want to truly understand how life works. Um, Ling made some errors, you know, in his books um, that we now know. And Pollock even said that in several of his interviews and even in his own book. But the thing is, Ling got so much right without actually having experiments to prove it, he knew from a thermodynamic standpoint that what Peter Mitchell was saying was thermodynamically impossible. In fact, it broke the second law. If you believe the Nobel Prize of 1977 was proper, that means that you believe that the second law of thermodynamics makes no sense. And Anybody who's a true student of history knows that the guy that proved Einstein's theory was named Alfred Eddington, and he once famously said, anything that breaks the second law of thermodynamics is fucking pseudoscience. And Ling basically spent his entire life trying to prove Mitchell wrong.